Hey guys, welcome back to Rave Culture Cast, your weekly guide to the EDM community, music festivals, and more. Today, I am super excited to continue with our series with Rachel Clark, the education manager over at DanceSafe. DanceSafe is a health and safety nonprofit dedicated to ending the drug war, providing on the ground services, uh, harm reduction, and distributing drug checking materials, amongst many other things. I promised you guys that I would continue to have episodes about harm reduction and festival safety, and today we are delivering just that. So here's what we're discussing today. Naloxone, aka Narcan, why it's such a hot topic right now, when to use it, common misconceptions about it, opioid overdose, uh, how to spot one and properly report it, how to act quickly if one happens in front of you, and what other incidents may be mistaken for an opioid overdose. Uh, misconceptions around fentanyl, what news is accurate, what's not, the dangers of spreading misinformation and sharing fal- false reporting, um, how to properly discuss what you may have witnessed at an event, and then also uh, mixing substances, what to be aware of to protect yourself. So DanceSafe is one of the oldest and most reliable um, drug checking resources out there. Rachel Clark is incredible. I love having her on the podcast. So we have a lot of serious information to talk about today, you guys. We're going to get into it. Uh, If you could share this episode today on your Instagram stories, Twitter, TikTok, tag at RaveCultureCast and DanceSafe in your posts just to spread this information out there. You guys, it's really, really valuable stuff to know about. So appreciate you guys doing that. But before we dive into things, thank you to Purple Garden, our sponsor of today's episode. If you guys are in touch with your spiritual side like I am myself and you want to connect with thousands of different readers like psychic readers, tarot card, astrology, all of that good stuff, um, you can head over to my link trypurplegarden.com backslash RCC to start browsing through readers and as a new customer, you will get your first deposit of $10 matched using my promo code RCC. So again, try purplegarden.com backslash RCC and use the promo code RCC. Um, You can chat with different readers via text, phone call, or video, and they are offered in English and Spanish speaking readers as well, which is a really nice option. So you guys can go check out the link, browse readers, uh, and let me know what you think. All right, with all that being said, let's dive into the episode today with Rachel Clark from DanceSafe. different setting this time but right welcome back to the podcast you guys today we have a familiar face on rave culture cast we have rachel clark here um from dance safe who is a harm reductionist education manager all of the things and we have um a lot of to- topics that we want to talk with you guys about today so we're going to kind of just like dive right into um why rachel is here and what she wanted to share with all of you guys today so Um, if you missed our past ones, we did an amazing episode about seven months ago, all about how to handle medical emergencies at festivals. And then we also talked about safety around substance use a little over a year ago on the podcast. So this is a continuing series and I'm excited to have you back. No ferret this time. (laughs) No ferrets this time. Total bummer for me and for you for other deals, but I'm happy to be here. Nothing cute to look like furry to look at people. I, I knew know. people were going to go off about that. And it was so funny reading the I comments. <laughs> I was thinking about going into my roommate's room and pilfering their tiny dog and just having <laughs> something, you know, I need like a live prop. Oh no, I love it. But how is, uh, how's your year going? I know you're busy as always. Yeah. Um, definitely has been a pretty fast and heavy start to the year for sure. Especially mm-hmm. for dance safe. This, uh, festival season that we're ramping up for is I mean it's it feels like this every single year but it, it's just mm-hmm. always there's always so much going on you know but it's, yeah. it's exciting there's a lot of progress being made yeah and I wanted to just start off by saying too I know um I spoke recently on the podcast about uh some of the things that happened at Okeechobee festival and I mentioned that I wanted to cover a lot more around festival safety and every time mm-hmm. you come on as well like we get so many comments and those are some of the most viewed episodes. So it's clearly a topic like people are passionate about. But um, today I know you had a couple of things you wanted to address, but one of which being um, the use of naloxone, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Narcan, That's right. yeah. Yeah. why everyone's talking about it, um, basically like kind of busting myths about that. We're also going to talk about opioid overdoses, um, signs of them, how to actually know that that's what's happening. 
um, how to properly use naloxone and uh, a lot more on that topic. But I kind of want to start off by asking, um, yeah, why, why this topic this time? Yeah, um, this has become, I would say in the last probably five or six months or so, all of a sudden, this has become a surprisingly complicated and difficult topic. And um, when I reached out to you about this, it was because we've been feeling kind of an unexpected set of consequences from this huge boom in people's awareness of naloxone and fentanyl. Mm -hmm. Uh, As with everything in the drug world, it's really a double-edged sword. It's very difficult to keep up with the amount of influx of interest and information that people are requesting when they come across a new substance or Um, Mm -hmm. there's a new trend or whatever, like there's just so much information that needs to be really, really solid. Otherwise people end up with a foundation laid that uh, can end up causing more harm than good. And in the case of naloxone, part of the reason that this has become so relevant is because ever since the boom of people's awareness in fentanyl, um, pretty much when promoters or individuals or organizations talk about harm reduction now, the only topic that comes up in a lot of cases is fentanyl and naloxone. Mm-hmm. And with that territory comes a fundamental profound misunderstanding of what's actually happening with mm-hmm. opioids, with overdose, where they're being found, how they can be ingested, what it looks like. Um, there's just a, so much misunderstanding now, unfortunately. So the pendulum has swung all the way from people being unaware that there's a risk mm-hmm. to people completely overgeneralizing the risk um, totally indiscriminate, excessive naloxone administration to things that are definitely not overdoses, have no resemblance to overdoses. Mm -hmm. Um, and this creates a really weird chain of events. Um, Mm -hmm. so we start off with like people who are well-intentioned that say, okay, everybody should have naloxone, which is the generic name for the, what you probably know as as Narcan. Right. Um, there are a bunch of different generic names or brand names. So that's great. Like people are aware, like naloxone, okay, you have that, you reverse an opioid overdose. Um, But then the training around how to actually identify symptoms is limited or people don't understand how you actually have to ingest it or what drugs it's actually being found in, which is still pretty limited, frankly. Mm -hmm. Um, And because of that, you end up with people who uh, mistake something totally unrelated for an opioid overdose or just kind of have fallen under the assumption that any negative internal or psychological experience is probably related to fentanyl. And then mm-hmm. you give someone naloxone, even though it was unrelated and you say you overdosed <clears throat> on an opioid and that person goes to therapy. And then there's mm-hmm. all these claims of mass overdoses at events because everyone gave naloxone, even though it wasn't indicated for things that didn't dis- display any of the proper symptoms for it. And then everyone and now reinforces, oh, well, this is what this looks like. This is what this means. And then there's a lot of shame and embarrassment and anger if people's stories around this are interrogated for Mm -hmm. accuracy. Um, People feel really invalidated. And even though this is something, this is an issue of like biologic impossibility in some cases, or just like it doesn't match whatsoever, or Mm -hmm. people shouldn't have to go through the trauma believing that they were dosed or had an opioid overdose. Like the, the point is to know what actually happened. And right. What to do. Right. So um, I wanted to bring this up because it is so incredibly nuanced and because the long term impacts of this are basically that people end up not really understanding what opioid overdose actually looks like mm-hmm. um, wasting Narcan, which is going to ultimately become an issue like there there is difficulty in access for a lot of people that are actually encountering opioid overdose and right. well of interest will probably influence the supply chain. Um, if it's this massive, you know, like this is not to discourage people. This is like, this is a huge spike. Mm -hmm. And, um, also with mislabeling people's experiences and with ultimately what we've seen a major consequence is that some venues have decided to bring law enforcement in to do pat downs and searches. That's a huge problem. So, um, yeah, that's my foundation for this.
Hey fam, just a friendly reminder that if you are planning to attend a camping festival anytime soon, I do have a free camping festival checklist on my website that you guys can feel free to print out and use as your packing list for upcoming events. I also have an Amazon storefront with all of my camping essentials linked, so everything from tents and equipment to accessories to wagons, things that you definitely wanna bring with you are all linked on my Amazon storefront. I also have a category on my Amazon storefront with a lot of my favorite rave accessories from Amazon. So a lot of the sunglasses that you see me wearing, some jewelry and things like that, a couple of shoes that I've worn in the past are all linked on there. So again, you can head over to my Amazon storefront to check out my camping festivals uh, list as well as my rave wear and accessories list. And of course, you can always download my free camping festival checklist on my website that will all be linked down below. Let's start there at the beginning with opioid overdose. And I want to just mention too, the reason that I'm glad we're talking about this as well is because it, it does feel bittersweet in a way because I'm noticing it in my own feed. Like so many more people are talking about it right now. Obviously um, there's different partnerships happening right now. So on one hand, it's like, okay, it's great to see um, an influx of harm reduction, or at least people putting the effort out there who have good intentions, which is what Mm -hmm. I believe. Um, totally. And having more access at festivals is a step in the right direction. But to your point, exactly what happens after you purchase naloxone or you get it at a festival, but you, even if you do the training, what if, again, you don't recognize when to use it, which is a great point because that's going to lead to so many other issues. But talking about starting with opioid overdose, what are actual signs for people to look out for? And this is obviously a general context, but also in the Mm -hmm. context of at an event. So um, the classic three is called the opioid triad. I say triad or occasionally I think I say triad and then I end up in like a doom spiral about which is correct. And I, I just like, I need to just announce this out loud because I'm like sure that it's triad, but I I think it's triad too. Yeah. It sounds (laughs) so wrong. Um, So the opioid triad is, um, the, the primary issue with opioid overdose is that a person's respira- respiration is depressed. It's respiratory depression. So that means that someone's um, signal to breathe is being dampened by an opioid. And that means that they will be breathing more slowly, more shallowly. And that's the danger of opioid overdose. Ultimately, that is the thing that is being addressed is slow or stopped breathing. And the goal is to stabilize somebody's breathing so that their heart doesn't stop. Because if you are hypoxic, if you have oxygen deprivation for too long, you can incur cell damage in your brain and other organs. And you can also enter into cardiac arrest, which is when your heart stops. So anything that does not demonstrate slow, shallow, or stopped breathing is just not a contender in this regard. And with this being said, there's a whole constellation of kind of like less expected and more unusual presentations of opioid overdose. So before anyone comes at me for that, like this is the big three are slow, shallow breathing, um, reduced or completely absent consciousness. Like you either can't rouse them or they're like very, very low consciousness, like slurring or barely moving or speaking, not really responding to you when you try and rouse them. Um, So a good way of doing that is uh, what's called a trapezius squeeze. So you kind of pinch the big beefy muscle at the base of their neck at the top of their shoulder, and that hurts. It's a pain stimulus. It should arouse them and wake them up. And then the third thing is pinpoint pupils, which is really small pupils or constricted pupils. If someone's pupils are dilated, that is not in line with an opioid overdose. Um, the thing about the pupils is that most people aren't really qualified to actually do a pupil check. Like if you shine your light in someone's eye, it's going to constrict naturally. So that's, you need to actually know how to do it. The idea Mm -hmm. is to pass a light over their eye and see how it reacts to the absence and the presence of the light. Um, probably the best indicator for a lay person. Well, a lot of the times it's considered to be an easy indicator for a lay person is pupils, but I personally have seen that go very wrong. Mm-hmm. So um, the biggest thing is, are they up and walking? It's not an opioid overdose. Right, right. Are they moving around and like interacting with you? It's not an opioid overdose. Like that's just not mm. what it looks like, you know? 
Right. If it's dehydrated, I know we talked about this last time a little bit too, but like a huge thing that medic C is dehydration, which <clears throat> in some cases, like depending on how bad people let it get can be like slurred speech oh, or yeah. passing yeah. out and things like that. But yeah, it's, it's a clear definition of like what to look for. Yeah. And there's also, uh, I think that when we spoke last, I hadn't released it yet, but on the dance safe website, mm-hmm. there's this giant article called why did they pass out? And that is like Love my, that. my magnum opus. It's like the piece that, um, is an attempt at compiling the majority of the likely reasons why someone would lose, lose consciousness or have a negative physical experience or something that could be mistaken for opioid overdose, um, including what's called a differential. So ways that you can kind of tease apart one thing from another. A really important thing to keep in mind is that people have been passing out, puking, dying, seizing, feeling bad at festivals and raves and parties since the dawn of Mm -hmm. raves and parties. Mm -hmm. It has not, like this has been this way the whole time. Right. People are just now all of a sudden aware of it and are misattributing it to fentanyl, even though the very, very, very vast majority of medical emergencies and events are not related right now. Right. And in that case too, because I mean, there may not be one answer, but if you you find yourself in this type of situation, whether you stumble upon somebody or a group that needs help or something happens quickly in front of you, mm-hmm. Is it best, it could be both, but is it best to go find medical attention as quickly as you can? Or do you think people are just reacting in that moment to what Mm. they're seeing in front of them? And they're just immediately like, I have naloxone on me. I'm going to use that without like really, like, is that, will that still be a problem if you do that, if somebody doesn't need it? So um, here's a few general rules Mm -hmm. that will hopefully make things easier. Number one, if you come across someone who's passed out unconscious, you happen to have naloxone on you, you can go ahead and give them naloxone. Like realistically at events, the actual likelihood of it being an opioid overdose really is like that is an outlier scenario still right now. Um, And the problem is that we really have very, we have no data. We have no data whatsoever. EMS is never, ever able to actually make that call on site because they do not have any, any, any confirmation power. Like they don't have toxicology reports, lab analysis on the substance taken, they can't confirm it. So you can give someone naloxone. It's, that's a perfectly okay situation, I would say personally. If you come across someone passed out, you don't know how long they've been there. They're not responding to your attempts to wake them up. Give them Narcan, that's fine. Um, if you come across someone who is conscious or seizing or whatever else, um, Seizing can technically happen with opioid overdose, but to my understanding, it's almost always when someone's been hypoxic, so they've had a lack of oxygen. If someone drops on the dance floor and starts seizing, you do not need to give them Narcan. Like that's just totally not indicated at all. Um, Generally, my two rules are, number one, have someone else go get medical if possible, stay with the person, like try to not leave somebody alone if, if you can and um, put them into what's called the recovery position, which you can Google images of it. It's really simple. You roll them over onto their left side. Um, It props their head up so that if they vomit, they won't choke on it, which is a really big risk and prevents them from rolling onto their face and asphyxiating. Um, So have someone else go get medics, put someone in recovery position. The second thing is, um, I just totally forgot what it is. No, you kind of said um, that. I mean, it was two things. It was, it was have two, somebody, yeah, two. have somebody go I, get help common, and then put yeah. them in that position. And I found the article too on why did they pass out? So I'll definitely um, link that down below for everybody. But no, I think that's a good, definitely a good rule of thumb. Cause I, again, I believe that people probably have the best intentions always. With, well, yeah. No. And, and they, and they <laughs> just don't know. Frequently. They probably, I mean, I've been in this situation now like twice and it's, you know, I go into flight, fight or flight, mode and your mm-hmm. adrenaline starts running and you just want to be helpful to people. And I'm sure of that's, course. you know, what people are thinking of doing, but yeah, go ahead. I, I remembered the mm-hmm. two and a half thing, yeah. which is that the biggest thing that I could beg for from anyone that's in this situation is not to try to diagnose what's happening, respond to what you see, convey only what you have witnessed and what you have done. Mm. That's where we're running into a lot of issues here is that you can say, Um, I was walking along. I saw this girl in front of me. All of a sudden she like fell forward and collapsed. 
I gave her naloxone 30 seconds later, she was awake and talking to us. Mm. You can say that. And that gives people that are qualified to draw conclusions, the ability to use the information that you provide them with to actually create a profile of what might've happened. Mm -hmm. It's not sufficient to say, I gave this person naloxone and they woke up and I reversed an overdose. Like that is just Mm -hmm. a complete overstepping of the information you have available. Like, unless someone can come to and be like, oh yeah, I just like snorted a line from my bag of dope. It was too strong. You know, yeah. like, that's a totally different situation if you're right. like, out somewhere in an urban area than if you're at a festival and someone just like spontaneously had a vasovagal episode and dropped to the ground. No, that's such a good point because that brings into so many other like things that have happened. And this was a big thing with Okeechobee as well, but um, yeah, and it's not fair to put that assumption on somebody else too, who exactly like may not, may not even touch substances in any way, shape or form. Sure. And you're saying that that happened to them. That's like, yeah. And, and that happens after festivals. Like you hear rumors go around on mm-hmm. Reddit and things like that of like mm-hmm. X overdoses happened. And exactly. It's like, exactly. how accurate is that number actually? It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And I work um, either with or alongside Festival Festival Medical on a really regular basis um, with like a few teams that really, really know what they're doing in this regard in our harm reduction medical teams. And it's, it is simply just not a thing that we come across like legitimate opioid overdose at events. It just doesn't really happen right now, except in like, I can't even tell you if there have been confirmed cases of it because all the cases that I've dealt with, Mm -hmm. people have gone and gotten toxicology reports and there's no opioid in their system Mm -hmm. or we've run lab analysis on the suspected sample. There's no opioid present. So like my sample size is always limited. The, The sample size of any person in any field of drug policy, education, festivals, anything, Mm -hmm. we're always missing information. Like we never have all the information from my perspective, from where I sit, from the information I have access to, from the teams that I have worked with, from the labs I have communicated with, from the hospitals who have um, run toxicology reports that have been conveyed to me because that's HIPAA protected. um, Historically, we really are not seeing opioid overdose at events except in very much like anomalous outlier cases. And it, it almost certainly has happened, Mm -hmm. but it is with a frequency that is so much lower than people think that it is. Right. Jeez. And you, and I wanted to talk a little bit too, just to address more about actually like discussing what you saw happened. And yeah, the other thing that's tricky is in these situations too, if you do go get help, like you said, nothing tends to be reported. So I, at least for me, like I sometimes want to know what happens after right. just to make sure somebody is like okay, or you know, what, like what actually happened to them, but what, any other tips you would give people to actually talking about what happened yes, or yes. who they're talking to after about what happened? Totally. And um, this is, again, I need to reiterate the fact that I come at this from a place of recognizing that I am inherently missing information. There could very well be events taking place and opioid overdoses taking place at events and festivals and raves and parties in circles I'm not part of, in places I don't visit, in communities I'm not in touch with. I'm absolutely leave room for that happening. Um, But like I said, a lot of this does also have to do with the actual drug market. And we can glean a lot of information about where fentanyl is and is not being found in the drug supply to help us inform the likelihood of people experiencing opioid-related adverse events at festivals, rapes, whatever. So um, this is really not an answer to the question that you just asked. Sorry, I'm just like- No, no, no. Quick, <laughs> You're good. <laughs> classic <laughs> story tangent. Um, that in the case of the drug supply right now, again, from the information that has been shared with me from research labs and um, hospitals, university centers, from people that are doing on the ground drug checking, from um, underground and renegade drug checking and FTIR, whatever. um, My current picture of the drug market is that fentanyl is extremely prevalent in drugs sold as opioids. Super, super, super prevalent. It is by far the most common thing that is there. That is where fentanyl is truly becoming a a really insidious thing for people to try to dose because they can't dose it accurately. Aside from that, 
occasionally I get reports of it in counterfeit benzos. So like counterfeit Xanax, et cetera. Um, and occasionally I get reports of it contaminating cocaine or meth. The only cases that I've been able to track down a proper breadcrumb trail for, for any other substances have been, I think a grand total of less than five for each of ketamine and MDMA for lab analysis around the country that, I, that has been reported to me. And this is usually pulled from listservs of people that are like the people that are researching this in their state or region. It's basically like we come together and we discuss what we see and we discuss trends. It's very guerrilla, like that's how it has to be. Um, again, information will always be limited. So when I'm looking at the likelihood of these things happening in, in festival and event spaces, it's like, okay, the symptoms that someone exhibits really do matter in this case because the likelihood right. of them being related to opioid overdose is just like statistically extremely low given mm -hmm. what the actual drug market looks like from the information that we have available to us. Right. Especially because of the issue of people getting false positives because they don't use fentanyl test strips correctly. So mm -hmm. if you over dilute any substance or you over concentrate any substance dramatically with any test strip on the market, you'll get a false positive a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. If you use the old blue fentanyl test strips with MDMA or meth, and any concentration except for 10 milligrams per milliliter and you need to, you can't use them on press pills of ecstasy, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. That can reinforce ideas about where fentanyl is located in the market because people are testing it correctly. Now to actually answer your question. Yes. Um, finally, a million years later, <laughs> the general formula that I recommend for people when you are responding to or trying to respond to a situation like this is, number one, it's okay to not be sure. Like, if you really are not sure about what you're seeing, administer Narcan, like totally, 100%. That's a great move for a layperson. You're not expected to be a doctor or a paramedic about it. It's okay. Um, just be mindful that that is not a diagnosis. That's an action that you took. Number two, again, send somebody else specific to go get medical. If you just point and say, somebody get help, people are whatever, like, you don't know what's going to happen. Point to someone, go get medical. Um, number three, it's okay to let medical take over from there. Like you really don't have to be involved in fixing the situation. You are probably not qualified to try and fix the situation. The purpose of pre-hospital care, which is emergency medicine is to stabilize someone's condition. So if they're breathing too slowly, the goal is to get them to breathe quickly enough. If it's an actual opioid overdose, the ideal breathing respiratory rate for adults is 12 to 20 breaths a minute, just about. So um, EMS will be trying to get their breathing to probably at least 10 breaths a minute, but ideally 12 to 20. Um, and then from there, treating any wounds or injuries and just basically like trying to stabilize the person's condition. That is the only role of pre-hospital care. It's not diagnosis, it's not curing, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. um, so then as a layperson, there really isn't much else that you can do honestly, mm -hmm. because their health records are gonna be HIPAA protected. Um, any toxicology report that's actually run if they do go to a hospital is going to be HIPAA protected. So they can choose to share the results of it publicly if they want to, mm -hmm. but that won't be available for weeks thereafter. Right. Um, there is no way for you to get information about the drugs that they might have consumed unless they send them into drugs data and the results are posted publicly. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, there really isn't much that you can do for confirmation. So right. when, you're, when you're talking to other people about what happened, once again, super important to say explicitly with timelines, with symptoms, with observations as neutrally as possible. I was walking along. I looked at my watch. It was about 5.30 p.m. I noticed that someone was sitting slumped over next to a tree. I went to go and check on them. I squeezed their trapezius muscle. They didn't wake up. Um, I shouted their name and clapped. They didn't answer what I said as I was calling to them. Um, I didn't know what to do. I gave them one dose of naloxone and one nostril. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't set a timer. I don't know how long I waited, but then I gave them the second dose and I point, it's a, I mean, things like this, you know? Right, right. Yeah, it makes sense. Especially because it takes naloxone, typically takes about two to three minutes to actually become active okay. via nasal or intramuscular roots. Mm -hmm. um, I've been trying to dig the pharmacokinetics of this because technically it shouldn't be possible for it to actually become effective within a certain very short, like few seconds of time. So mm -hmm. if someone's like, 
I gave them Narcan and they like immediately woke up and were perfect. Like that, I mm. don't believe that that should be physiologically possible due to right. the administration, but I'm not a pharmacologist, so I can't say. I'm figuring that out. Sure. No, but that's good to know. I mean, it is like, again, I think this is all valuable information just for anybody who, again, is like looking into the trainings or finding it now, you know, more readily available on site at large music festivals and things like that. But I think just being able to talk about what you've seen clearly, because, you know, as we know, I'm sure there's a large amount of people that are going to watch this, but there's so many other people who are uh, trigger happy online and they're going to write whatever they want to write at the end Mm -hmm. of the day, which is unfortunate. But um what is like, I just want to clarify with you. So with yeah. null, we're basically, I know it's probably hard to actually confirm, but we're basically saying at festivals that the, the chance of it being a fentanyl overdose is probably very, very low at this point. Correct. At this point in time. Yeah. That's like just based off of the drug market and off of the mm-hmm. symptoms that people actually exhibit. Like the problem is that I think that folks are very suddenly very aware of how many people go to medical Mm -hmm. at festivals and events like I've been paying attention to this shit for a decade but right exactly a lot of people I think didn't even notice like you're really vigilant now in a way that people haven't been before Mm -hmm. so it can be really scary when you start realizing and this is this happened you know where I live there's this whole I'm in Utah and there's this whole thing about yeah there were like 15 it was mass overdose 15 people dropped in the span of 15 minutes and I'm like realistically everybody took their molly at the same time mm. and everyone took too big of a dose and overheated simultaneously and like literally and went to go vomit in medical you know like yeah that is really typical <laughs> it happens of what happened time. yeah yeah a hundred percent yeah and it, it's just like one of those things where sometimes I get flack for this for people being like you should never discourage people from using our candidate it's like that's not what this is about this mm-hmm. is like if someone is like throwing up and you put a bandaid on their arm, it's not going to do anything and it wastes right. a bandaid. Like it's okay to know what you're looking at to a mild degree. Mm-hmm. And it's okay if you're really not sure. It's okay to be a little bit trigger happy with Narcan on site at events. Sure. Um, when you're out in the world, it gets more complicated if, if there are people that are not opioid naive. So they use opioids on a regular basis. It, you could make them really, really sick if you get really trigger happy with Narcan. So that's a whole other complicated yeah. element of this. Yeah. And I've been thinking about like chronic pain patients and things like that too. Like people who take opioids on a regular or daily basis for pain who might be Narcan into the sun at an event. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know if that's ever actually happened, but it's just a scenario that I think about sometimes, you know? Yeah. And I have two other quick things I want to talk about with this. Mm-hmm. One being just in general, I think, bringing up this topic. It doesn't just have to be about naloxone. I've noticed at festivals, it's more just, I want to make our community again, just like more aware um, and responsive to issues that are happening. Cause even if yeah. you in, in that moment can't help, yeah. like for whatever reason, maybe you're under the influence and you see something in panic and you know, you can't help, but being able to just like tap the person next to you on the shoulder and like point out something. And yep. I was at EDC Orlando this fall and it was very early in the night, like it might have been 5 p.m. And, and there was a girl who was very, very clearly like extremely drunk by herself crying. And like I saw her the same time this guy saw her and he went over to help her. And obviously I just like naturally had a moment of like, is he with her? Is he not with her? And he was clearly mm-hmm. trying to help her. And then it made me feel amazing because three other people like ran mm-hmm. over to her immediately, like sat her down we went and got like a security guard who brought her. And I was just like proud of the community because that many people Mm -hmm. stopped what they were doing to go help this girl. And I just want to see more of that because, you know, if you're young and you're at these festivals and stuff like that and you see something happen, a large majority of people keep going on with their night and don't stop and are, you know, aren't going to do anything about it. But just knowing that more and more people are educating themselves and will intervene makes me feel better. So that's kind of like yeah. where I'm at with all of this is like, can we just get, make it to the point where more people are like aware of the medical tents and where those are, know what ground totally. control is like just being smarter festival goers is what we're aiming for here. I think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the other part of this that I think is, um, there are two, well, there are two big things that I think are really important here. The first is recognizing that the people that are on site at events that are doing first response work, whether it's ground control or a roaming team or actual EMS or anybody else, 
are not and should not expect be expected to be drug experts, mm-hmm. even if they're a nurse, even if they're a doctor. Like mm-hmm. you are not inherent, especially if you're law enforcement. Especially I was just, if you're going to say that. Yep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Anything that oh, yeah. law enforcement says about drugs, I immediately am like, cool, that's probably just not true. Like immediately. Um, and I think that it's really important for even people that have background in things that are kind of adjacent to this topic, but your job is not specifically an illicit drug market analyst and educator, right? Like, it's a really limited pool of people that focus their energies and people who work at syringe exchanges aren't going to be experts in festival culture either. Like I've had some conversations recently with some health departments that they were trying to like maneuver big festivals in their cities. And they're like, Narcan, Narcan. And I'm like, that's really important for your demographic. But this demographic, the majority of people that go to the med tent are going to go there because they got really drunk. They're super dehydrated. They overheated or they took an adulterated substance. That's totally different or they're, tripping balls and freaking out and like crying and puking and shitting and whatever. And like, oh, God, it, it, I'm saying how many first timers <laughs> too. That's the other thing you yeah. forget, to, especially like thinking about the type of event that mm-hmm. you're at. It's like how many people in the medical tent are like f- taking Molly for the first time, right. or doing whatever for the first yeah. time. It's a lot of that as well. Yeah. It, it's a demographic yeah. specialty. Like this kind mm-hmm. of thing is a specific demographic using a specific set of substances more commonly by far than others. Like, it's just a totally different kind of environment. Mm -hmm. Once again, I forgot the second thing that I was going to say. No, me too. Well, I do do want to touch on this because I'm pretty sure we we covered it a little bit in the very first episode we did, but it's been a while. We have a lot of new um, subscribers at this point. But another thing I want to address, because I'm sure it could be another thing that you're witnessing is mixing substances because people never... I feel like there's charts and people talk about it, but Mm -hmm. I don't know how factual the information on TikTok is. You know what I mean? So Uh refresh on mixing substances and what people need to know about that. Definitely. And I'm also going to put a pin, help me out here. I'm going to put a pin in the other thing that I remembered once again, which is that um, talking about like the polarization of information, like the polarization of drug use and conversations around drugs. So um, interactions, one of my favorite things to talk about because- they're so frustrating. Mm -hmm. Um, When you're looking at an interaction between drugs, you're not looking at like, oh, mix a stimulant and a a depressant. You're looking at, we're mixing like MCPP with methcathinone. Like you need to know the specific drug that you are mixing with each other specific drug in order to really get a picture of the kind of interactions that might take place. But even that information is usually fairly limited. The good news is that there are interaction checkers like um, drugs.com has an interaction checker. Drug bank has an interaction checker that I really like. Um, those are entirely focused towards, you know, FDA approved pharmaceutical substances. But the good thing is that the majority of drugs that are used illicitly or the majority of the most popular and common use drugs that are used illicitly are actually like schedule two substances that are prescribed in some capacity. So like meth, fentanyl, cocaine, cannabis, or THC, like all these things have actual interactions that you can check on interactions checker. Um, Then there are things like classical psychedelics and MDMA, but like ketamine and cocaine, for instance, you can totally check interactions with those um, on ClearNet websites. When it comes to specific medications, a, um, a resource that I recommend is the spirit pharmacist, which uh, the guy that started the spirit pharmacist actually has legitimate qualifications to be speaking on topics of like pharmacology and is like a PharmD and an MPH, I believe. Um, and it's a really great website for kind of understanding the underpinnings of these topics from the perspective of someone who wants to help people learn, not just discontinue necessarily, but like learn about interactions for combining if they want to, um, especially from a me- mental health lens. So that's a great place to go. Interaction charts are really reductive and a lot of people prefer them because it's such a simple and easy digestible way to collect the information, but then you get into the territory of things being extremely subjective and really lacking the nuance of how important the dosages are. So most of the things on there that on any given interaction chart that will say like dangerous the dose really does matter. 
So for instance, like Fenibut, which is something that probably no one here has ever heard of. It's just like a supplement that was developed by the Soviet Union and is an anxiolytic, so anti-anxiety and can be a nice like gentle under padding below psychedelic experiences or whatever. The whole thing about Fenibut is never drink on Fenibut. It's really dangerous and can make you really sedated and it vomits, spins, et cetera. And that can happen. Um, however, there's a really big difference between taking four shots and then doing some Fenibut or doing some Fenibut and like sipping on a white claw every few minutes over the course of two hours, like totally different, completely and totally different. Right. So that's a really big, important thing to note is that generally the more you can titrate something. So the more you can gradually increase your dose of something and very much have like a controlled dosing regimen, the easier it is to combine things in a low risk way. Um, I personally am a total proponent of cocktails. I love, I love mixing drugs. Like I think it's the most fun and it just is kind of like an art form to figure out how to do it right for yourself. And some things have higher baseline risk levels than others. Some things it's really like you are taking a risk by combining them. Other things Mm -hmm. like SSRIs and MDMA, for instance, people are always like going off the walls about how it causes serotonin syndrome. But realistically, the very vast majority of the time you just don't roll. And the risk comes Mm -hmm. from when you just try to take a bunch of Molly because you're not rolling and then you overheat and that's a real problem. Right. Hey fam, just a reminder that if you need tickets to any of the following Insomniac events this spring and summer, I've got you guys. So we have Project Glow coming up this April in D.C., day trip happening in California at the end of June, and then Moonrise happening in Maryland in August. If you guys need tickets, check out my Insomniac affiliate link down below. I really appreciate you guys purchasing through me. It means a ton, so thank you guys for doing that. Again, right now we've got Project Glow, Day Trip, and Moonrise all linked below. All right, let's get right back into the episode. Could there also be simple things like, because I'll raise my hand and say I did this once and it was the worst fucking night of my life. Uh, <laughs> but even just like combining certain substances with caffeine, like oh, totally. I literally totally. drank two Red Bulls, had Adderall mm. and did something else. And it was the, oh. li- when I tell you I didn't sleep that night, it was the worst night of my fucking life. And I was like, mm-hmm. I will n- never be that dumb ever again in my life. But mm-hmm. But throughout the day, you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. drinking Red Bull vodkas leading into the night. Like it was just a combination of like all of the dumb shit I did to my body. And it was horrible. You know what I mean? But you you don't think about how all those things are going to like add into each other. And you think like, oh, that's so innocent because it's, you know, a caffeine drink or whatever. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're really, I I honestly, the, the longer I'm in this world, the softer my boundaries around everything become with what I know about things because everything is just like there is very little that I consider to be like concrete fact baseline information about drugs like it is unbelievable how complicated things are how big the spectrums are how circumstantial everything is how dose dependent, root of administration dependent, position of the stars dependent, like, oh, freak accident. I ate an English muffin this morning and now my mushroom trip is way more intense than it's ever been before. And I don't know why. (laughs) It it just is like the amount of uncertainty involved is (laughs) totally chaotic. And what we're really looking at, in my opinion, is averages. We're not looking at like a thing that has things on either side, like one state of doing drugs that has things on either side of it. We're looking at averages across a population and averages for a person. Like we need a bunch of data points to be able to tell what the most common experiences are. And just because a drug is capable of doing something pharmacologically doesn't mean that it actually is going to do it under a certain circumstance. So I just did this whole, I just went off on Twitter the other day about, <laughs> um, about the definition of the word toxic, because calling a drug toxic is everyone's favorite way of telling other people that they're stupid for doing that drug. Like, oh, I can't believe you, you eat methyrol, which is like Adderall that just contains meth. Like, oh, it's toxic. It's neurotoxic. You're going to die. That's stupid. You're stupid. You're bad. Mm-hmm. And the reality is that the word toxic or toxicity is pertaining to whether something is poisonous and the Mm -hmm. word poisonous is pertaining to whether something can cause or causes illness or death when introduced into the body. 
And by that definition, then I would be able to say water is toxic as a flat baseline statement because there are conditions under which water is toxic. Mm. Like mm-hmm. if you drink too much water, it's colloquially referred to as water toxicity. It can cause right. um, hyponatremia and then cerebral edema, which is where your brain swells because you have too low of a ratio of salt to water and mm. you're overhydrated. And then because your brain is swollen, there's in- increased cranial Jeez. pressure. And uh, it's, it's just like a whole thing. We're going down another rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, so what the fuck does toxic, how does that yeah, help yeah, us yeah. at all? People are yeah. like, is, is this drug toxic? And I'm like, ah, give me a thousand different parameters and I'll tell you if what I consider the possibility of that mm. substance being toxic in this specific way and the specific manifestation is. Yeah. Well, I'm going to link what I have all these resources you mentioned. I'm going to link all these too. So people can just kind of like follow cool. up on, on the like drug checking <laughs> rabbit. Um, hole. But to come back to the pin, the polarization of, Oh my God, thank you on drugs. Yeah. Let's, let's wrap up with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, Really, when I when I have these conversations about naloxone, about being conscious of these things, about trying to administer naloxone with intention and do your due diligence and use messaging, there's always this very strong feel of, feeling of anxiety around this topic for me because what I've felt And what I've witnessed is that the same kind of polarity that puts people in the camp of drug is good, drug is bad, um, which has also happened with like psychedelics and weed and like people that were um, or have been very acclimated to the drug is bad camp or all the way in the drug is good camp. And anything other than the drug is good camp is like you're damaging the mission, you're pushing back on the movement, whatever. And I feel the same concern with conversations around naloxone because there definitely have, there's a lot of grief. There's a lot of tenderness around this topic. There's a lot of pain. There are people who have lost people left, right, and center to preventable situations. People who are living with a feeling of lack of closure, of grief, um, of completely overwhelming anger at having been put in this kind of situation. and it makes it really difficult, I think, to have conversations that attempt to find a balanced approach to this topic, because I think that it's really easy to just be like, everybody should give Narcan if you're not sure, no matter what, all the time. Right. And it's like, that is definitely like a piece of it, you know, like, I don't disagree with that inherently. If you're not sure, you should give naloxone. But I think that it is. it remains and will always be a critical part of these conversations and of this mission to make it feel okay to receive information across the spectrum and synthesize it into one complete idea. And I'm always down to be wrong about things. Mm-hmm. Like this is the information that I have right now. This is the information that is generally shared and has been shared across the people that are allies in my space, in my field. Um, but just, I think a good thing to keep in mind when we're approaching these topics is feeling the internal pushback and feeling the paradigms that are set and feeling the emotional baggage and history that comes from having been personally impacted by a topic like this. And we are really hopefully all doing this for the same reason, which is to try and make the world a little bit of a kinder place. Definitely. That was so well said. One last thought I did want to ask, um, just in general, this is kind of like to a specific group of people, but for people in my position who are content creators or social media influencers, influencers, whatever you want to call it, who are trying to preach harm reduction or are trying to get involved. Mm -hmm. Like there's just been a lot of, you know, misinformation spread lately. And obviously accounts that are trying to be helpful, but publish videos that end up going viral that have like factually incorrect information about drug testing and things like that. Like if you were speaking directly to content creators right now, like what yeah. advice would you give them to help them feel like actually more informed before they make more videos? Cause I do feel like that's, you know, yeah. people are listening to people online and they trust accounts and they take it yeah. for face value what they're saying. So. Right. Um, that's a really, really great prompt. And what I would probably say is operate under the assumption that you are missing information 
and maybe take some time to kind of before you share content like that take some time to ground in do I feel like I can share this with an open mind to being told that I'm wrong and what will I do if I'm told that I'm wrong because people might not always be kind about telling you that you're wrong like this Mm -hmm. I think there's a very high level of baseline tension with this topic because especially if you work in harm reduction a lot of these topics and conversations you hash out 100 200 300 a thousand times you your patience runs thin sometimes honestly Mm -hmm. like it just happens um and the other thing is to be extremely humble in how you present your information present the sources for your information directly verbally acknowledge the gaps in what you know do not present things as being certainty or confirmation like it really, I think that the language here matters so much more than anybody ever thinks it does, because mm-hmm. it is also a lot easier to say, I was wrong about this. If you post content and you're like, Hey, this is the information that I currently have available. Here's where I got the information. Mm-hmm. Always do additional digging there. I'm not an expert on this topic. Um, this is to signal boost this information. Right. If you present yourself like an expert on the topic, it's a lot harder to kind of backtrack and be like, okay, well, I'm an expert, but I just like completely fucked this up. Mm-hmm. So leave room for that. Be honest about what you don't know. Awesome. That's amazing advice. And lastly, before I let you go, any, I guess, well, one, any trainings that you guys currently offer <laughs> or anything along those lines that people could do? <laughs> uh, that's funny that you say that. I actually have a call. Um, coming up called dance safe training annihilation because <laughs> we're like three of my coworkers would be pissed at me for saying this but like our training's outdated yeah as fuck and <laughs> it's and we're you know we're a small team trying to do a million things at once so like yeah. it's been on our radar but with dance safe um we do not have direct trainings on this topic however um i can send you some resources that you can link that might awesome. be helpful there are yeah. a bunch of really awesome organizations especially if you're looking for stuff just around naloxone like there are some really cool organizations that um will have like training videos and content around that um just the last thing that i want to note though is Mm -hmm. that like i said different organizations have different demographic specialties so sometimes an ssp or syringe exchange for instance might say like everything has fentanyl in it and they might say that because for their consumer base, for the demographics of people that they work with, everything has fentanyl in it because mm-hmm. the people that they're working with are consuming the drugs, like opioid adjacent drugs and drugs that are frequently transported with opioids that really do have fentanyl in them all the time. Um, but it's important to not hyper generalize that to other settings as well. And that extends to <clears throat> recognizing that naloxone trainings are frequently um, filmed by SSPs and people that work directly where there's a really high prevalence of overdose. Mm-hmm. So the steps to responding might be like a little bit more direct, you know? Right. Right. Cool. Yeah, no, I appreciate those links. And then, uh, I'll link the, why do they pass out article, but any other articles or anything that came out recently that you want to plug? <laughs> God, there's so many, honestly, like it's we'll so link, overwhelming. We'll link to your Twitter and dance, all of dance. Oh, God. Pages. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this was so helpful as per usual. Thank you so much. Is anything else you wanted to share? Do you feel like we wrapped it all up? <laughs> it's never, it never feels wrapped up. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a Fair six enough. year long ongoing conversation basically. Mm. But as always, I appreciate you making space for these topics. It really of means course, a lot. Yeah. No, thank you so much for reaching out again. And I'm, I'm glad we were able to kind of like go into more depth and, and piggyback off of the last two episodes. So again, guys, I will link um, our previous episodes down below. If you have any questions, like again, they're a small team, the DMS are open, but please respect (laughs) their time and what they have going on. They are dealing with a lot of things. Um, but leave comments on this video too. Like I'll be sure to, to follow up with you guys and get you information that you need. I know I don't have all the answers, which is why I have Rachel on here. Um, so I do great practice as well. Yeah. (laughs) Listen, you're not going to see any drug testing videos from me because I'm not (laughs) the expert in that. I'm going to fuck it up. So we're not going to do that. 
Um, but no, I, I very much appreciate you being here and yeah, guys go, um, Dan safe's information is all going to be linked below. So please give them a follow. Uh, you guys know where to connect with us at rave culture cast on all of the platforms. Uh, we have an amazing Facebook group community and discord. If you guys want to join, uh, if you enjoyed the episode, please consider sharing this with a friend, your rave fam, anyone that you think would find this information valuable. And we will be back next Wednesday with a new episode. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks. Thanks.